Dear participants, I'm so glad to see you all here. I have got high hopes for what we can achieve today. And uh, we are so lucky to have Advocate Jay Suresh as our resource person uh, for webinar series. And his today's session is all about uh, protection of invention, a techno-legal interview. And I have seen Dr. A. Mohendram sir also in the meeting. I'm so proud to see you, sir. I have attended one of your seminar, IPR in general. So proud, sir. Yeah. So without taking much of time, uh, so let's start today's session. And to the participants, you can post your queries in the chat box. We'll address the same at the end of the session. All right. Over to you, sir. You can start your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Yeah. Uh, is my screen visible to all of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Yes, sir. Uh, there is a Nico from your microphone, ma'am. No, you are okay. Your audible is your audible. Yeah, fine. Thank you. So, good afternoon, friends, and a warm welcome again for this webinar, second Saturday of this webinar, where we are going to specifically look into patenting inventions and Indian perspective. I'm extremely happy to say that uh, the session of last Saturday, I was given to understand that uh, it was very interesting and uh, useful for you all. And today, the topic itself is very, very interesting, complex and challenging. So what I'm going to do today is to make this complex topic as simple as possible with a bag full of illustrations to make this one hour of this session to more interesting for you and so that you can understand the basic concepts as well. Before we start, let us have a recap of previous session. So we started off with uh, last Saturday or uh, with tangible property and the legal rights that are associated with that, like ownership, which we also learned that Ownership is a positive right, positive legal right. And then we moved on to the essence of the previous session that was intellectual property rights. And then we saw what are the types of intellectual properties. Intellectual properties sometimes called knowledge goods, which are indivisible, indestructible, and inexhaustible. Those are some of the characteristics which we have seen last time. And then we moved on to having a look at types of uh, intellectual property rights, that is patents, trademarks, copyrights, design, so on. And then we have, at a reasonable length, got an insight into the significance of trademarks. And also we have seen some of the non-conventional trademarks, how they are protected in India and in other countries as well, such as smell, sound, etc. Now, today we are going to select one of the species of intellectual property rights, that is patents and which protect inventions. So we are going to see what is invention according to law. Invention you can define in many ways, technically and legally, so on and so forth. But what we need to understand is that what patent law defines invention. That's very important for us. That we're going to see today. And then we are going to look at a very important aspect of patenting, 
which is uh, what we practice day in, day out as patent attorneys. That's called how to look at patent specification, how to draft a patent specification, how to enforce the draft which you have written. So this is something a very fascinating area and where it involves not only legal skills, but also technical appreciation. And then we'll move on to see some of the, uh, at least an example of how patents are enforced, how you can, suppose you have a patent, right? How are you going to enforce against an infringer? So I have a case where I would like to share with you to highlight how these things are enforced, at least in India. Then finally, we are going to look at an important development recently. That is, we are having a legal dispute with regard to whether inventor should be always a human person or a machine can become an inventor. This is a fascinating area, I think, where in next 15, 20 years, probably we are going to see this issue coming up at least on daily basis, like the way we had when computers were invented in 70s till 90s. Uh, computers occupied the every sphere of human activity. So the next 15, 20 years, this is going to be a buzzword. That is whether a machine could become an inventor. That is, a can a machine think like a human so that machine could be vested with uh, patent rights, right? So that's a final topic. So this is going to be, and at the outset, uh, let me also inform you that considering the complexity of uh, the topic that we are dealing with now, I may overshoot my limited time of say 60 minutes to maybe uh, an extra time of 15 minutes. And I hope that you would bear with me in case I extend the uh, scheduled time that is given to us. OK. Now, we are going to look into protection of inventions. As we know, patent law provides protection for tool knowledge, which we have seen last week. What are they at all? Primarily, tool knowledge, they are inventions. That is not just an idea, but a workable idea, we could say that. So those are called invention. That's a creation of mind, new ideas, which could be, a, which could be converted into workable proposition. So the patent law protects such inventions by vesting a right of ownership in the inventor or the owner of that invention. So that right is an exclusive right, which we touched upon last Saturday. I also mentioned that this right, which is exclusive, is a negative right. That is, if you have a patent, it carries with that, it carries with it primarily five types of rights. That is, as you can see on the screen here, making, using, selling, offering for sale, and importing. This is a tremendous right. Uh, one could expect from a patent. Imagine, say, if I have a product which I have a patent in India, nobody else could make, nobody else, you, nobody else can use, sell, or offer that for sale and import that product in India. That's a, certainly a powerful right because of which uh, no country would prefer to dispense with this right. Is last week we touched upon saying that these rights are territorial in nature. So if I have an Indian patent, so my rights are confined to the state of India or to the territory of India. So no country is willing to say that, okay, you have your Indian patent. Why, why can't you enforce that Indian patent, say, in United States? 
that's not going to happen because that such is the powerful right no state would like to dispense with it so that brings us to the important aspect saying that considering this uh, powerful negative right how these rights are acquired how these rights are enforced and how these rights are monetized okay now let's look at the document say you are all exposed to uh, having uh, say having a look at property documents or any ownership documents if you buy a house or a land you go to sub registrar's office and get it registered and you know that that's a document that's a title deed for you that establishes the ownership of all the property and in that document there you can find many clauses and finally we will find this is my dimensions of that particular land on the west side it is some somebody's side on this south side it is a road so on. so your boundaries of your site are defined in that particular document so that 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 claim that is for your ownership and similarly if you have an invention patent document is nothing but a title which gives you ownership over your invented uh, product or a process now here the tricky thing here is as far as a land is concerned they are physically measured and you can establish the ownership or the meets and bounds of the property but whereas in case of an invention say for example i have invented a new pen which can write on any surface how can i put it in a writing in a plain english to define the meets and bounds of my invention so therefore in patent parlance we call this definition as patent claims which we are going to see in detail so one of the essential elements of a patent document is claims i would say it's a heart and soul of a patent document so here you can see on the left side of the screen this is uh, what if you have a us patent this is how it looks like in the middle you have an indian patent it's a patent certificate granted by in india and on the right side you find this apparently uh, a patent granted by queen way back in 16th century to its citizens so patents have very very long history uh, probably you can go back to 14th or 15th century now in order to get a patent right it's a long struggle it's not an easy thing you have to spend a lot of money in addition to the efforts that you come out with an invention and it involves time it involves uh, collaboration with uh, patent agents or patent attorneys and then you have to interact with the respective governments who act as a patent examining authorities and then finally you will get a patent so if you see here is an inventor once the idea is conceived either inventor can go and file patent application directly with the patent office there is no need for people like us absolutely there is no need and if inventors prefer they can approach patent attorneys who can help them in drafting the patent specification which i have was referring to in my previous slides so patent specification is nothing but description of your invention whether it is a product or a process you describe in english in plain english and it is a techno legal description sometimes in my uh, experience of say this 25 25 26 years i often i often get uh, what you call like communications from inventors saying that say we had sent you our invention details you have drafted this and we are looking at the specification but i really wonder 
whether this is my invention or not. So that's a feedback we gen generally get. The reason being that inventors are technical people, technical persons, and uh, their vision is something we call it as a tunnel vision. Whereas patent attorneys, uh, they don't look at the invention the way inventors look at them. We look at it from a different perspective and we provide the legal language. So it takes a different, slightly different shape uh, when you look at the patent specification. It won't be like, say, some for technical people like you, you are all engineers over there. So if you write a thesis for a PhD, you describe your, I, that is, uh, your uh, research, uh, what you call subject matter, in a great detail. And then you get a doctorate for it. I would say each patent document qualifies for one PhD. But in a different way, uh, their technical emphasis in a patent document will be not much than that you do in a PhD thesis. OK, good. So now we move on to uh, the next area that is uh, how, what is that? What are those inventions that could be protected under law? So, under Indian Patents Act, see, that is uh, presently we have the Patents Act of 1970, right? So that act defines what could be or uh, what can be invention. It says it could be a product or a process, including improvements. So that is very important. So it is not necessarily that. You can get a product alone. You could get patents for process. That is a method of making something. And also the improvements. That is, uh, if you come out with an improved product or improved process, still you are eligible to get a patent for that. How? As long as you satisfy these three conditions, which I would call it as three finger salute, that is NI square. That is, in order to get a patent, you should, invention should be new, sorry, and inventive and industrially applicable. Please bear in mind, even if your invention does not qualify for any one of these legal requirements, you cannot get a patent for your invention. So this is the way, gateway uh, to obtain patents. So this particular definition or requirements Globally, they are standardized. That means globally, anywhere, if you want to go and apply and secure patent, you have to satisfy these three legal requirements. Now, why is it that, Pete, your invention should be new? For the simple reason that uh, in case if invention is not new, then there is, uh, uh, it, it became a wrong thing to grant a patent for a subject matter which is already known. So for example, you have a mechanized toothbrush which you have been using for five years or so. And then suddenly, uh, sorry, let me put it this way. You manufacture a mechanized toothbrush and then you have been making and selling it say for over five years. And some one fine day you get a notice saying that I have a patent for a mechanized toothbrush. You cannot use, you cannot make it and sell it. So you would, you would think, hey, what is, what's, what's happening here? I have been making and selling it for the last five years, and this gentleman comes and tell me you cannot make and sell them. henceforth. So that is the situation which patent law avoids by saying that if you want a patent for an invention, that invention should be new. And it should not be used uh, prior to, say, filing of patent application for that particular invention. So invention should not be publicly known or publicly used before you file a patent application for, for its protection. Now, today I have a very interesting example to show you how novelty of an invention could be lost. Now, let us look at this. I have 
an invention having it's for a device any could be any mechanical device having three elements a b and c and somewhere somebody else disclosed in a journal or say for example in a newspaper a uh, same device with identical components that is element a b and c so you can see on the left side is my invention on the right side there is a prior publication and prior publication has happened prior to my invention that is i have conceived my invention i am about to file a patent application for this that's the stage of my invention but i there was a prior publication now what happens is if that prior publication is disclosed and if all the elements are disclosed in the prior publication my invention is said to be sorry the novelty of my invention is said to be lost because it is anticipated all the elements stood or they are already disclosed in a single prior publication please mark my words why is it that i am repeating single prior publication because novelty can be challenged only on the basis of a single document or single prior publication so it is invention gets anticipated so novelty is something which you can easily establish it is very simple say i have a product having elements and this is the state of the art where you have all the prior art or publication available and then i make a one to one comparison and say if it is present novelty is lost if it is not present novelty is present so it's very simple thing now let us look at this scenario same thing as in the previous uh, example we have a device with three elements and we also have a single prior publication but the difference is that element c is not published so we can easily say that since element c is not known my device with a and b and c can be construed as can be considered to be having novelty right then if you see and make a comparison there is there is no complete overlap only overlap of a and b c is still not present in the prior publication so that gives us a conclusion rather to say that my invention is new now so there is no anticipation it's very clear isn't it now let me give you uh, a real incident which happened in the year 1964 and which we patent attorneys even today cite these examples because it's not only an interesting uh, example but also it drives the point of uh, clearly how novelty could be lost as you see here see the background for this case is that in the in the year 1964 a freight carrier that's a ship carrying about uh, 6000 sheep uh, docked at kuwait's harbor that is called harbor called al kuwaiti so they were offloading these sheep and uh, when they had offloaded about 500 sheep for some reason something happened and the freighter got uh, what do you say got sunk uh, something happened and then while unloading so it started sinking and it went into deep waters along with the remaining say 5000 ship there uh, partic this harbor was uh, particularly used for supplying in drinking water to the residents having the desalination plant and so on and so forth so people were pretty much worried because uh, the sheep which were drowned they were getting uh, decomposed and they were worried about uh, the contamination of water 
And this particular freight was insured by a Danish uh, uh, company. And they hired an inventor, a Danish inventor called Carl Croyer. And then they told him, can you do something? Uh, see, they wanted to lift that freighter with the cranes. And it was a bad idea because uh, while doing so, they could even damage the ship. And then because if once the hull is damaged, everything is blown out. So they could not use cranes to lift the ship. But so they, when they asked this inventor, he came out with a brilliant idea. They say, OK, I will, I will do this. What he did was he came out with an idea where he pumped in uh, polyurethane balls of polyurethane foam, plastic balls. See, polyurethane balls have uh, lesser density than the density of water. So they float. So you can use them as a flotation device or buoyant uh, object. So he started pumping in, say, about 27 million plastic balls into the freighter ship, which is sunk in, which is deep inside the water. Then after he has done this, he was able to uh, then the ship started floating up because of these balls and uh, they were able to retrieve the ship along with the uh, decapitated bodies or whatever it may be of the ship and then without much of a damage. And here, uh, the cost of lifting this uh, ship from under sea or underwater was $3.25 in 1964. And whereas the insurance claim was $2 million. So uh, they were able to save a lot, lot money uh, with this idea. So this inventor did not stop there. He said, OK, this idea worked for me. So why can't I go and file a patent application for this? So he filed in Great Britain. He filed in Germany and also in Netherlands. What you're seeing on screen is the Netherlands patent application number, that is NL6514306. So as I said, the patent specification should have drawings. So here he has given a graphical depiction of how my, his invention can, could be implemented. Then during the examination stage, surprisingly, Netherlands patent office refused to grant patent for this invention. What was the reason? The reason they said, there is a prior publication of your invention before you file this application. OK. What was the prior publication? And this was the prior publication. Well, you can see, uh, those of you interested in comics, uh, say this is about uh, a comic, Walt Disney's, and you, you have Uncle Donald there with his nephews. Uh, you can see picture strips here. This was published in the year 1949. That is 20 years or more, 20 years prior to the invention of uh, this particular inventor. And this graphical sequence, we can see here the plastic, instead of uh, polyurethane balls, here they use ping pong balls. And their uh, nephews are pumping these balls. And then it goes into the submerged shape. And then finally, you see the ship is floating back again. Is it not interesting, say, this particular comic strip has a, had a potential to destroy the novelty of an invention. Imagine the lakhs of rupees or lakhs of dollars that inventors and others, they spent in retrieving the ship really from underneath the water. And then they realized that this particular idea was known much ahead of time. So that is the importance of uh, what we say when you apply legal principles to technology. You may find that technology is much, much superior and has an immense value, but you may not get a patent for such invention for the simple reason like this. So it is 
essentially what we need to do is whenever you have an invention you must try and do what we call it as a due diligence study to ensure whether your invention is a novelty or not right let's move on now the second requirement as i said it's a active step that is in addition to the novelty you must also establish that your invention is inventive what is the difference between uh, novelty and inventive step difference is that uh, it should have invention not only be new but also it should provide a qualitative technical advance that is it should be technically superior to the ones already known mere workshop improvements will not constitute say for example i have a pen and then is a cap so i have a press fit which locks the cap to the body of the pen so this is known so tomorrow i come out say for the safety reason i come out with a cap with a thread so that i can screw fit this cap to the body so i have two different invention one with press fit other is to use a thread but they perform the same function so it can be argued saying that hey what you have done is nothing but it may be new because let us assume that thread fit was not known prior to this so i came with that invention but there could be an argument saying that hey what you have done is just a mere workshop improvement that is there is no intellectual skill involved in improving so inventive step is the one your invention should not only be new but it should have a technical advancement and the other distinctive feature of inventive step with the novelty is that whereas novelty can be destroyed with single prior art and whereas the inventive step is done either through by referring to a single prior publication or combination okay let us look at this example i have an invention there is a prior disclosure which discloses only part of my invention not completely but there is another disclosure which discloses us say the remaining part of my invention so the com combination of disclosures of uh, one and two makes my invention obvious thing to try so there is a lack of inventive step my patent application could be rejected even though my invention is new so in patent practice uh, what we could see here is that there are many patents which are won or lost based on the satisfaction of the inventive step the significant role of uh, patent attorneys uh, uh, is reflected in constructing the inventive step of the invention here you're looking at an example here how we can say uh, the inventive step can be used or how prior art publications can be used to uh, defeat the inventive step of an invention here see here what you see is a video uh, laptop and generally laptops which have the swiveling action which you can open and close the display unit can be opened and closed which is performed by a device called a hinge which is located here and here which is nothing but a simple hinge by using that you can operate uh, sorry you can operate this uh, movement for the video display unit now when if i want to file a patent application for this i would file for the video display unit with a hinge let's assume that we have a prior art references or prior publications where this is a tabletop calendar where hinge is used here and this is a what you call a kitchen cabinet uh, where you can see the hinge here and this is a piano lid where hinge is used to perform very much pretty much similar functions that you can see with regard to the video display unit of a laptop so now uh, once you file a patent application for this and then while examining examiner may cite these citations or any third party can cite these citations and say even though 
nobody has used this lid uh, prior to this application for a uh, for a laptop that so therefore this particular invention is novel but people have used this hinge along with its functionalities in many other applications such as that's why we call it as non analogous art because they don't relate to laptop but nevertheless they perform the same function here the problem is same and the solution is also same but only the application is different so in such a scenario then it it can be said that this invention of using a hinge for a laptop could be construed as an obvious thing to try therefore it lacks inventive step right okay the third requirement uh, it is uh, your invention in addition to uh, novelty and inventive step should have industry it is one of the simplest uh, requirements that can be met that is it must have industrial utility your invention should have uh, industrial utility okay now after having looked at the definition of invention now let us look at uh, how this patent specification looks like see when i was started my patent practice about 26 or 27 years ago uh, when i joined a firm uh, they gave me first day they gave me uh, one draft and uh, that draft was to identifying an object under c so uh, i did not have any clue of uh, uh how to draft that and the technology was so complex and that's how it is so it's pretty challenging task in a sense that uh you uh, for patent attorneys uh, it's uh, learning by doing you will not have precedence if at all you have precedent that could not be considered as inventions right so every day is a new day and challenging day for patent attorneys particularly when you're faced with technically complex inventions and imagine that you have a scientific device and then you are asked to describe in a very simple english language and not only that they say define my ownership of that invention that's the more complicated thing for a patent specification and also the style of drafting differs from country to country in india we have a different style of drafting patent specification whereas in us uh, they have a different style so it adds to more and more complexity now let us look at the standard format here see what i have done here i have uh, selected a us patent which is easy to show you uh, it's not that i am not fond of indian patents it's just an example uh, to give you a look of maybe some of you would have uh, already seen in experience so this is a typical uh, us patent document you can see patent number here and there are other bibliographic details this patent is for reclining sofa that is the title of the invention and this is the drawing of the reclining sofa and uh, there are there will be normally there will be many drawings to highlight the novel and inventive features so it's very important for engineering inventions to show uh, the device or invention in a way that is visually appreciated like so so we do drawings and then once those things are ready then we will describe the invention this the document you are looking at is nothing but a written description so you have seen the drawings and first and initially we saw the bibliography and this part of the thing which you are seeing now is nothing but called written description that means you describe your invention in a detail uh, and then you move on to a very important part which i have been talking about that is claims here you can see what is claimed a section so far comprising uh, a pair of reclining seats element one element two three four five this is the most important part of any patent specification because you define the meets and boundaries of it which that is the reclining so far that he's claimed here 
has a legal right only to the extent of the language that you have used in claims. You must have described the invention, say, in about 50 pages. That doesn't matter. What matters most is what you have claimed. Right? So this is the very important, and it requires a very special skills to define claims. And then, so your patent is ready, and this patent is a granted US patent. Very interesting one, which we are going to see. Now, so what is this written description of a patent specification? It should be full, clear, and concise. And you also should describe best mode. That is, in a sense, that what is the best way to uh, make this so far, rather. Other important thing of uh, written description is that description should support claims. Let me give an example here. See, I have a device where I have four elements. That is A, B, C, D. And then, which is what is defined in the claims part, right? Whereas in the written description, I have described on only A, B, C, but not B. See here, please make a note that I'm using two different uh, expressions. Whenever I talk about claim, I use the term definition. That is define, defining A, B, C, and D. And when I go to the description, I say describing A, B, and C, so on. So there's a very important distinction between what is defined in claims and what is described in description. In other words, description is always much, much detailed than claims. So here, now, the important thing that you have to note down here is, even though I have described these four elements in the description, but I have not claimed the fourth element. <coughs> so, the thing is, even though I have described, but if in case if you are not uh, claiming for that, whether my invention covers this fourth element D. So that's an important thing because whatever you claim in the claims should have support. That is, if you are claiming A, B, C, and D in the claims, that A, B, and C should be present in the disclosure. Otherwise, you, you cannot claim something which is not disclosed in the written description. Now, okay, let's look at this. So there was a sailor who was uh, going on a voyage to a uh, different country, and he, he was at sea. So his wife was pretty much worried about him. So she goes to a congregation and he tells the priest, Father, see, uh, my husband has now gone on a voyage, which is a very risky thing. So please pray for him. So the priest was in a hurry. So he dictates, saying that John, having gone to see his wife, desires prayers for safety. So there is a typographical error there. You can see there, instead of yes, E, E, it was typed as yes, E, E, right? So then, <clears throat> then it was, uh, when it was read and it was published, it was like this, John having gone to see his wife, desires prayers for his safety. So imagine a single letter or a single alphabet could make things better or worse. In this case, it is far worse. So that is important of drafting of a claims. It is said that one has to be very miser in using words, particularly when you draft the claims. Now let's go back to this so far thing. Here, as you see on top, an image where two people are sitting in a sofa and they were they, probably they were watching TV. And here, this lady is looking with the head turned towards this side. And this, this gentleman is looking straight. That means uh, when these sofas were made, recliners could be made, could be mounted on the ends of the sofa. That is, if you have an L-shaped uh, sofa, 
And if you want to have a reclining seat, you should have this reclining arrangement here and one here. It cannot be, it could not be had in any other place. So therefore, difficulty was that one would be looking straight, other would have to strain his or her neck to watch TV. Now, so this particular inventor, which are looking at the bottom, he was able to overcome the problem. That is to have a L-shaped sofa where you have these two recliners facing straight. That is both can see straight who are sitting on these recliners and which can be controlled by a reclining arrangement. So this was the, this particular arrangement had a problem and that problem was solved by this invention. So the US patent, uh, the invention file, the inventors filed the US patent application. And this is about a case which actually happened, Gentry versus Berkline. Gentry is the uh, inventor who filed this patent application for this reclining sofa. Uh, but what I would like to emphasize here is, please look at the claim language carefully. It says, uh, sorry, control means located upon the center console. That means console is here in between these two recliners. And this is what the inventor is trying to define, saying that I have a switch here on the console, which if it is operated, will, op will uh, uh, say, operate the recliners. So using this switch, you can operate these two recliners independently. So you have a console here and you have for this, you have a uh, control means that is switch, nothing but switch. So we have to bear in mind this particular language because in patent parlance, what is claimed is yours. What is not claimed is not yours. This is a fundamental principle that we all should bear in mind. Unless you explicitly say what or define what is your invention, you cannot draw additions or improvements thereafter uh, uh, from the, uh, for this invention. Now, so after this uh, Gentry Gallery, uh, patent application was published. Berkline, who was one of the competitors for Gentry Gallery, started manufacturing this reclining sofas. And uh, they started making and selling what you see here. It also has a dual reclining mechanism. But the only difference is that this reclining, uh, what you control means, is not on the uh, what you call central console. Probably uh, you could have it here, or you could have it here, or here, somewhere. So the question here was, my patent claim defines an area of the console where control means could be present. That means that my claim eliminates a possibility of having this control means anywhere else apart other than the console means. So when Gentry, the patent uh, applicants, noticed this, he said, hey, what's going on? So my invention is being stolen away. Then what he did was he went back and amended the claim because it is possible that you can amend the claims during the course of uh, the examination of your patent application. So after seeing this infringement or somebody copying his uh, technology, he went back to the patent office and said, okay, I want to amend. What is the amendment? A pair of control means one for each declining seat. So are, are you able to uh, hear, judge what is the difference? In the previous case, or in the previous version, it was specifically mentioned that located upon the center console. That is gone now. He says, I could have anywhere else. He has removed this central console. But patent office, they rejected this uh, broadening of claims saying that, look, 
you have described your invention say in about 20 pages but nowhere you describe saying that this could be at a place other than the central console so therefore infringement was not established in other words uh, the competitor escaped from the liability see why i am trying to show this example because Patent drafting is not just like what you do or what you write uh, for any other purpose. It's not just a written document. It is a legal document. And every word, every full stop, every comma that you use has, uh, they have legal implications. So that's the lesson. Uh, that's a takeaway rather uh, from this example. OK. OK. Now, we are trying to draft a patent claim for a simple looking, I would say, chair, right? Then if I were to ask you, assuming that you're all patent attorneys sitting over there, to draft a claim for this, say, so for example, inventor has conceived this chair and he approached you to draft a patent specification for you. So what would you do or what I would do rather? Okay, I say, right, I looked at this uh, object. I know what it is. I have understood clearly. So therefore I define what I say, a chair having a seat, which is here with four legs. Yes, one, two, three, four, and a backrest attached to set seat. This is the backrest, okay? So I being, a uh, very uh, honest, straightforward person. And I wanted to do justice to the invention, saying that, look, you have invented something. I want to protect that invention for you. That's the agreement between you and me. So be happy. This is the claim. Go ahead. And then uh, let's assume that patent is granted for this. Then, as you have seen in the SOFA case, this particular gentleman for which this patent was granted, he would notice that there was a stool being manufactured with three legs. Now, look at this. I have a claim here having a seat. Okay, seat is here. Four legs, but I have only three legs here. And a backrest. There is no backrest at all here. So, how could I say that the this claim infringes uh, or this particular stool infringes this claim so after seeing this i get uh, i become more and more wiser now so i say okay don't worry i will say i will modify this claim a chair having a seat with at least a leg so now i can cover this and probably the other scenarios as well so here, if you see here, this particular language of the claim is broader than this. As you see here, here, the number of words here used are many, but the scope is much lesser. Here, I've used a few words, but scope is much broader. That's the technique here. So, OK, then I said, OK, this will take care of me. My problem is solved. Then after a while, I visualized, I found out there is another uh, seating arrangement like this. As you see here, there is a seat here and you have this suspension, which is uh, probably suspended to a ceiling. And this is what is called a suspended chair, which has no legs, no backrest, but still it is a chair. Oh, then I get a shock of my life. I say, okay, let me go back to the drawing room and amend it. So I amend the claim as a seat positioned horizontally in space. That's it. Now, as you see here, the claim language of this probably would cover this or maybe this because they're all positioned horizontally in space. So here, the takeaway is that when you are drafting a patent specification for an inventor, it is not that you should confine yourself to this first uh, disclosure of the invention, but also you must extend your thinking to near future where there are possibilities of having modifications, improvements, changing, happening 
to your invention. Okay, now let's move on. We are running short of time. Uh, Indian patent law does not probably define what could be patented, but nevertheless, it says there are many inventions. Mark my words, I'm selling, there are many inventions that could not be patented, even though they are novel and inventive, such as uh, discoveries, new forms of a known substance, admixtures, computer program per se. That's very important, being you're all engineering students over there. Computer program per se in India is not patentable subject matter. But uh, some of you may uh, immediately ask me, hey, I've seen many, many patents granted in India for computer programs. Yes, uh, for that, you need to understand what's the legal definition of per se. Right, go on. let's go on. Now, let's look at the discovery. Discovery, I said, cannot be patented. How do you differentiate between uh, a discovery from an invention? If you look at this screen here, as you know, the bauxite is a primary source of aluminum, and it is available uh, in the topsoil. And this is an ore which can be chemically processed to produce uh, alumina. And then this alumina is then smelted using a process to produce pure aluminum metal. So can anybody claim uh, for a patent for a bauxite ore? In other words, is bauxite ore is a discovery or an invention? So how do you draw distinctions? That is, invention is something which was not in existence before and which have created using my human skills or human ingenuity. Whereas in case of discovery, it's already present. What I did was I discovered it, like Columbus discovered uh, America, which is already there. OK, now let's look at another example. We all know Benjamin Franklin, uh, who was a voracious inventor. And uh, he was so fond of electricity, that is, uh, the thunder, lightning, sound was fascinating for him. And whenever there used to be a storm, he used to go for a horse riding uh, to study what these thunders are made of, were made of. And then one fine day, he realized that this lightning is, uh, has, had nothing but electricity. So he wanted to prove that. And uh, during a storm, he went on top of a church. And then he was trying to holding some devices with him to see whether was there an electricity in the lightning. But he was very disappointed. He could not uh, do anything. And then on next occasion, he said, OK, during the storm, let me fly, uh, let me fly a kite. And then he was flying a kite with a metallic key attached to the kite. And then when the lightning struck, there was a huge electricity pass that passing through that key. But unfortunately, uh, Benjamin Franklin was not electrocuted because the power of the lightning is about 50,000 watts. So it's a highly powerful. It carries a large uh, voltage or the electricity. So he came out with an idea called a lightning rod. So here, the discussion here is whether Benjamin Franklin discovered or invent. The principle that he, it was there already, lightning having the electricity was there. So probably that could be construed as a discovery. But how to capture that lightning without damaging a structure that is having a lightning rod and which is connected to the ground so that when lightning strikes, the electricity is captured by this rod and then goes down to the earth without causing damage to the building. So electrical lightning rod is an invention, whereas the lightning is a discovery. OK. Now, so discoveries are not patentable in India uh, that we have seen. So only inventions are patentable. Now, I have uh, an invention here. Let me take you quickly. I have selected this because now we are all over. We have been wearing this 
face masks for the last two years now. So we are all familiar with this technology now, even though this application was filed somewhere in the year uh, 1999 in India. Okay, this application, this patent was, uh, this application was filed by 3M and, uh, and patent was granted for this, uh, uh, what you call it, this personal respiratory protection device. So this is how 3M's patented product look like. If you, brief, if you look at this, that means it is uh, made up of a single uh, material having three portions. You can see this is the top portion, this is the middle portion, this is a uh, uh, lower portion, and you can see the lines separating these portions. So when they uh, secured patent for this, these are the uh, elements that are claimed. That is non-pleated main body, two lines of demarcation, bisecting fold, so on and so forth. Then Venus, on the other hand, started manufacturing a, a, an identical looking mask in India. So as you see on the left side is 3M's mask, on the right side it is uh, Venus mask. So 3M sued Venus for patent infringement. And when the case came up before uh, a Delhi High Court single judge and the judge granted injunction saying that, yes, Venus was infringing 3M's patent. So then during the course of uh, further hearing and uh, what happened was uh, after the injunction was granted, judge started hearing the matter and judge came to a conclusion that claim was invalid. That is, he took a totally different decision and he vacated the injunction. Why he said claim was invalid? The lines of demarcation, uh, that is uh, what you see here and what is claimed here in the patent claim of 3M, stand disclosed in a document that is, which is here, 3971369. So that means the subject matter of the claim has already been disclosed in a document. That's what the judge came to a conclusion. And then he said the patent was invalid and injunction was vacated. So 3M appealed. Then when this appeal normally goes to a, a two member judge like this, and then this was heard again. And the two member judge, by hearing this, so as you see here, uh, this is the 3M's uh, patented uh, mask. You can see demarcation lines here. And what is cited as a prior publication, as you can see, they have a pleats. That means these are pleats, but they are not demarcation lines. That's what 3M argued. And secondly, they said, uh, there is another document where they said, these, this mask is joined here, whereas in my case, uh, I don't have any join because it's a single monolithic structure. As you see, there is no joint here. There is no joint here. So then they said, therefore, uh, this particular patent claim was valid. And uh, the injunction which was vacated was restored and Venus had to stop manufacturing those face marks because injunction was restored. So that's how we see here. That means whenever the infringement is made out, it is not, comparison is not made between the two rival products. No, comparison is made between patent claim and the constructional features of a product. That means claim versus product, but not product versus product. Now let's move on to the final uh, area that is artificial intelligence. Now here, uh, let's give a brief uh, context to what I would like to convey to you. See, this AI is something which has been there for some many years now, at least since 1950. So broadly, AI can be stated as uh, machines to mimic the problem solving and decision making capabilities of human mind. That is, that is to think and do like human mind, to put it simply, right? And it is, it's occupying the every sphere of human activity. And uh, particularly during COVID time, you would have seen uh, many apps, many technologies coming up uh, where they have used uh, this AI 
say for example covin where they say who are is vaccinated the information is available probably they would have used ai to uh, implement that particular uh, app or uh, solution why is it that uh, ai is expanding rapidly now because we have powerful computing architectures now where which can uh, process large volumes of data and above all we have very improved uh, ai code models that is we have neural networks and deep learning which can mimic or simulate human thinking as a result of which we have more and more machines started thinking like humans yeah it's probably a dangerous thing that we are going to do. see and the advantage of this ai is that it's application agnostic that means it is not confined to any particular application it could be medical field it could be commercial field or it could be any other field mechanical field as well it can be applied to any field and particularly as you see uh, internationally there is a lot of patent applications are being filed for protecting this core ai technologies and there has been a over 55% increase since last decade so that you can see the rapid increase of protection of these technologies particularly in us in 2002 there were 30000 applications whereas in 2018 now it is 60000 patent application covering ai for iphone users they know what is siri that is uh, it is nothing but uh, answers articulated questions and then uh, once you ask to do something your phone would respond through siri it is called intelligent automated assistant which is nothing but a uh, in ai for which apple has got a patent and before i leave the screen i just want to mention you that there is a chinese inventor who has sued uh, apple saying that uh, apple infringed his uh, uh, patent for uh, this automate intelligent automated assistance that is uh, which can provide response with the spoken commands and he was claiming billions of dollars against uh, apple okay now let's move on to the inventorship so far we have seen that yes if your invention it should be conceived we say the product of human mind we say right in the first last week uh, we discussed that it's a product of human mind but here we say ai is not a product of human mind but a product of a machine so therefore how is it that if an invention is conceived by a machine can a machine get a patent or in other words can a machine become a owner or a machine can can a machine could become an inventor so that's the thing that is the consequences uh, the issues that we are facing if you look at the categories of invention uh, there are broadly two one is where human invents and then tested by machine second thing is whole thing is done by the machine probably in the first case there is a possibility of uh, securing patents but in the second case we have issues that is everything is done by a machine where there is no human contribution at all then how is it that humans can claim uh, inventorship over that so there was a case very interesting case called dabus uh, this is an acronym uh for device for autonomous bootstrapping of unified sentience sentience is nothing but having a feeling of sensation like no feelings like human being so here a scientist developed a machine and then that machine came out with an invention what is this invention invention is something like this it's a container shape of a top uh, outer uh, body of a container like a bottle this is a cross sectional view so therefore top view you can see it from top it has a zigzag arrangement on the edges that means if you are using in a carton these bottles it's like a puzzle they fit easily together so that there won't be any breakage or slipping when these bottles are placed in a container so this design was conceived by machine so he named that machine as dabus so and then they say even though this machine was conceived uh, so this invention was conceived by the machine i own the machine so therefore the invention belongs to me 
So you grant patent to me. That's what the argument took taken by the inventor here before European Patent Office as well as before US Patent Office. And unfortunately or fortunately, uh, they said, no, we could not allow you this because under law, inventors can only be humans, but not machines. So this patent was refused. And interestingly, in South Africa, patent was granted for DABAS because in South Africa, they don't examine the pat patent application. They just grant it if it is uh, satisfies the other conditions there. Now, OK. Let us look at the India now. Indian scenario is that uh, uh, we have about 5,000 patents for patent applications filed during last decade. And 63% uh, of them belong to multinational corporations. So you can see the extent of domination of A patents in India by multinational corporations. So we have to catch up. This is the law for uh, as far as inventorship is concerned in India, which is very similar to Europe and US. That's it. That says that an application for a patent can be filed by any person. So here also machine, according to this law, which is existing presently, uh, machine cannot become an inventor. Finally, yes, what are things that we have to bear in mind? First in time, first in right. That is, if you want to ha get a patent for an invention, you cannot be a tortoise. You have to be run like a hare. You have to file first and secure the invention. Because it is patents are not granted for those who invented first, but they are granted for those who go and file patent application first, right? Just ideas are not patentable. You should have functional and workable ideas to get patents and patents for inventive creations, not for discoveries. So that's all for today. Uh, I can now take questions. Sorry, I've extended my time, but nevertheless, I think I've stuck to the extended time of 15 minutes. Thanks a lot for your patience and presence. Oh, that was a wonderful and fruitful session, sir. Now the participants can ask your queries. Either you can post it on the chat box or uh, you can unmute yourself and can ask your questions. So let's wait for a minute. Sure. Okay, so far no questions have been raised in the chat box, sir, but I'm having a doubt. Can I? Hello? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yes, yeah, sir. Sir, suppose uh, when two or more applicants uh, apply for a patent for the same invention almost for the same year, okay, so my question is uh, who is going to be awarded the patent? So is that something based on first to file based or, you know, first to invent based? The answer is whoever files first uh, okay. would be given uh, the patent, right? Not the one who invented first. If two applicants, say one applicant files yesterday and mm -hmm. the other applicant files today, the patent mm -hmm. rights probably would be awarded to the one who filed yesterday. Okay, okay. So can uh, an Indian get a patent in the US? Yes. Uh, you can, uh, even foreign nationals, uh, they can. Only thing is you have to file a U.S. patent application in order to get a patent in U.S. Okay, okay, fine. So thank you so much no for the clear-cut answer. Now I invite Assistant Professor Jaren Jacob to deliver the word of thanks.
thank you sujim uh, so today session was also a value on value on uh, session to our knowledge in the intellectual property rights so uh, jay suresh sir the advocate have uh, added so many knowledge uh, so many information to our knowledge under this topic uh, just like he told uh, there are so many uh, students and teachers who are interested in research as well as inventions so today session would have helped uh, everyone who listened to this what to do when when it comes to an invention is not about inventing it's all about the taking the patent so whoever is filing the first he gets it so that's it so everyone take care of it every students who have an innovative idea so try to follow up the procedures for these uh, patent protections and all uh, innovation protections and uh, today's session was wonderful uh, jay suresh sir you have uh, delivered the message uh, well and it was so effective to everyone so the presentations uh, the slides were also very informative thank you so much sir for providing us uh, such a wonderful session hey can i add can i add one more point there okay though you have just you know delivered your vote of thanks yeah and, uh, sure sir. okay what about you suresh are you are you ready to listen to me always always okay sir. okay suresh i let me come back to the daiq okay mm -hmm. so the mission which is producing certain products okay that products cannot be i mean invented i mean a patent fine good but what about the machine if the machine is patented and then if it are, what are the producing the machine which is producing don't you think that be deemed to have patented yes if uh, the machine satisfies the condition of uh, novelty and inventorship and the inventor for the machine is a human person yes you can get a patent for the machine no, no, let us assume it has been already patented if it is already patented then of course uh, one cannot get a patent subsequently for no, a not for the mission the production the produce of that mission yeah as long as the products are new say if that's you that's what i'm saying so here the question is artificial intelligent quotient has been injected in the mission when that produces some noble things cannot be patented that is been answered here when the mission is been already patented and then when the products which are produced by that particular machine don't you think that has been deemed to be patented it is just yes of course yes yeah as long as there is liability a vicarious liability in the sense you know see for example when my my, my when, I, when 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 i have been just you know i mean already the machine has been done it taken care of it and then not only the machine has been patented the products of that particular machine also ought to be patented oh, no as a i mean patent attorney you are a better person to answer me this other it is be technical the reason anyway i have just raised this question not that 100% answer i am expecting from you so, okay now yeah uh, if that machine is uh, something which is already known and uh, if that machine produces uh, some products which are say assume that for the sake of assumption that they are novel yes there could there is a possibility of uh, uh, getting a patent for the such new products say for example you have a pharmaceutical substance see now yeah. new pharmaceutical substances are created by humans chemists scientists they do research but while doing research they do use ai that is said they they of use course, a computer yeah. they uh, try and search for thousands of formulae structures and then they work around do the extrapolation and they come out with a something new so here there is a combination of a human endeavor and a machine and the result is something which is new so such a new product can be patented because it's a new novel molecule now let us look at a different scenario if machine does everything that is uh, there is no human intervention at all there are no scientists sitting no chemists sitting you put everything dump in the machine and then the machine comes out with a new formula so this is where the problem of ai comes in no there. no my question is a machine is a human invention right no yeah. problem yeah no problem at all see, see for you example can. we are the you know we are the creators of god okay i mean we are creating something it is we deep god has deemed to have created that yeah 
Oh, no, I'm so, sorry. Uh, okay, okay, fine. Okay, you can you can uh, get yeah, a patent okay. for a new machine. There is absolutely that's, no problem. That's right. Okay, okay. Thank you, Suresh. Sorry for you're welcome, that. sir. No problem. It's very higher. It's entertaining, and then your thoughts are very insightful. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mohindran sir. He is the principal of the Mount Sion Law College. Thank you for your presence, sir, and for the doubt. Uh, so it was a wonderful session. Once again, uh, thanking for the thanks for the resource person, as well as all the uh, delegated fa faculty members who have joined, uh, especially the principal of Mount Sion College of Engineering, Matthew, sir. Also, uh, Vice Principal Thomas Chow, sir, and uh, the coordinators of the program, uh, Dr. Uh, Smith Amis and Ajit sir. Also, uh, the administ all the dignitaries in the administrative uh, panel of the Mount Chain College. Thank you so much uh, for all the faculties who have joined and the students who have shown interest in uh, getting gathering some knowledge in the innovations and patents. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. I, I would like to pin on everyone to uh, the upcoming session on the coming week, the third session and the final session and, uh, on the intellectual property rights, that is on the copyrights and designs. So everyone must join on the coming Saturday. It's on the same time, 25th Saturday, 4 to 5. So wish all will join that too, the final session. Uh, the feedback have been provided in the chat box. So everyone fill up that one. And thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining. So see you all next Saturday. Bye. Bye, sir. Bye.